me again. Yet again, doing another live, but um, this is more specific to um, just updating you on how things are going and kind of showing how progress is. Yet again, if I don't get anybody asking questions on the chat, that's perfectly well and fine. This format works out really great being able to just sort of update how things are going. Um, I wanted to kind of show at least all of the knives that I happen to be using for all of the, um, all the wood carving. Um, specifically, these are wood handled knives called Flexi Cut made in the United States. And um, a lot of them come in three piece sets where you happen to have um, quite a few different pieces. This one happens to be sort of their longer um, three piece set of knives and they have a sharpening compound in the bottom. Um, what I've been mainly using the most is just been their, their cutting knife, which just happens to be sort of, it's not quite as long as the middle length on this other set, but um, it's nice wood handle. It's actually a bit ergonomic, so you can put your thumb on the top of this and have quite a bit of pressure as you're pushing through the wood. And um, just happened to have a couple extra blocks that I had ordered that didn't get used in the current project so far, but I have spares, which is always important because mistakes can happen. Um, these happen to be made out of basswood and uh, basswood happens to be a really soft carving wood that is in the linden family. Um, there's basically linden trees in America, but there's also that version over in Britain. They sometimes refer to it as lime wood, but it's not related to the citrus lime trees and the fruit that one would think of. The um, both the basswood and linden lime wood are very easily carvable with hand tools. Um, and surprisingly enough, with the doll that I'm creating, if you're following on Instagram, of course, things uh, are updated regularly there. I also used a one and three eighths inch dowel that uh, was made of poplar. And this was sort of a darker heartwood. And with that, I was able to um, make the arms and legs. And there's pictures of, of those as well. And I'll show the doll also, so I'll take you with me here in a minute. Um, this is sort of a chip knife carving set. Yet again, they, they have the compound and a different carving knife. I haven't really, I've used use this knife out of the set. Um, I do have an X-Acto knife also. And then there's this uh, even smaller chip carving knife and then some detail knives in this particular set. Um, so basically, let's see here, three, six, nine, 10. So I have a 10 knife set that I've been using mainly. I do have Exacto's wood carving, which these are more like a chisel tool set is what it makes me think of. But uh, I've not had to break into this one as of yet, but that's one that I um, have just as a backup. But uh, I happen to have one of the dowels that I was using here. This is poplar. You'll notice it looks kind of very similar. Now, granted, we're dealing with a lighting issue because, you know, overhead light and a desk lamp. So there's only so much light to go around. But they're very similar in color as far as the sapwood of the poplar and the basswood. They're very much similar colors. I just happened to run into a dowel, bigger one than this, that was a grayish color, which is more like the heartwood the deep inside of a tree. And um, besides working on the doll itself, I've been able to assemble it, dress her, and put a, um, put a doll stand together, actually. 
I noticed some of this compound on the one edge is kind of coming loose. Something I'll have to keep an eye on because uh, the sharpening compound there is uh, a nice feature. Now I have a wet stone, so if I really need to, I, I have ways of sharpening my knives anyway. And let's see. Oh, I do. Hold on. It's another big piece of basswood. Now this is actually going to be the doll head. I haven't really worked on it in a little while, but I'm trying to kind of scoop out a neckline and a jawline, and I'd at least like to shape the face and then put a nose on there. Um, after everything is carved, I'm going to do gesso, which is a paint and glue combination. They've basically used gesso for a very long time as a way of treating a surface and preparing it for more paint. Um, you use that a lot for canvas, which is sort of post period as far as canvas preparations. But I find that with a lot of the wood carvings, especially the reliquaries that are actually in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they mention gesso as one of the um, ingredients that is used on these beautiful reliquaries that would hold um, bones of the saints. So, and they were normally carved to look like a human person. Um, all you have to do is visit uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, New York. And if you look up reliquaries, you'll find them. Um, they happen to be particularly stored in the um, part of the Met that is referred to as the cloisters. A lot of their medieval specific items they have all together sort of on the upper edge of Manhattan, not near their Fifth Avenue Museum, but up on further in Manhattan, they have the cloisters set up, which I did get to go visit a few years ago and was an amazing uh, visit. And I highly recommend it when things open back up again. And um, of course, granted, that's going to be a little while. And a lot of museums are actually having their collections put online for people to enjoy and view. And the Met already was doing that to begin with. They have a lot of their particular inventory already on their website. So you can search some things right on the site, which is also helpful, especially if you're like me and like to do research. So right now I'm gonna have quite a bit to do because we're still sort of square, having to round this all down. And then I kind of carved out a very, um, you won't be able to see it on the film, but basically I carved out where the ears are supposed to be and where the jawline is going to sit relatively. It's not perfectly even, but granted, people are not perfectly symmetrical. People are proportional, not symmetrical, which is kind of fascinating because one foot will be slightly bigger than the other. One hand might be slightly bigger than the other, like ring size, for example, things like that. Um, so that's been an adventure in itself is just kind of working out the math and proportions and relatively trying to keep things even. But I'm going to take you with me here. You get to see a different spot of my room. And I'm going to turn you around here. Because, da 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 da. Now, I'm going to see if I can sit this on the floor and a little further away. This is not the best view, but she wouldn't exactly be easy to pull up to the desk either. Um, but what I wanted to particularly show is the carved hands. So we have a thumb, we have four fingers, and then we also have a thumb and four fingers. This hand's a little bigger than, than this one. So I'm hoping to smooth this one out a little bit and get rid of some of the extra wood eventually. So the feet ended up turning out the same way. And I'm gonna try to see if I can pull these out here. 
makes her a little shorter, unfortunately. But uh, we have we do have feet. So I'm using basically pegs that are put into the legs itself. And there's a little hole on the inside to hold them in place. Now, they don't stay in place very well at this point in time. Like, if I pick the doll up, sometimes the, one of the feet and one of the hands, generally the right and left ones, they tend to, unfortunately, like to fall out. So, I'm trying to devise whether or not in the holes, if I want to take the or, or put some wool on the inside of it and force it up in the peg whether or not that'll allow it to sort of secure into a, a spot or I could always use some hide glue put it on the inside of the holes and permanently put the hands and feet in a permanent position I like that if they could be movable where you could have wrist movement would be kind of nice but uh, I was able to reshape the feet a bit. They're not perfectly the same. Like this one's slightly smaller than this one. But I've been able to at least work on the soles of the feet a little bit better and smooth it down. And these have been sanded. The hands have been sanded a little bit. So slowly but surely things are getting there. I'm going to try to put her feet back in place here and in the right spot. <laughs> so basically they fit right up inside just like that. Now with this doll, I've had to kind of put her on this stand here. And she kind of likes to change her position a little bit. But it's basically just a wooden plaque with a much larger dowel, this size dowel. It has basically, it's a 36 inch dowel. I've probably taken off about 10 inches. So it's like about 24 or 26 inches tall. And that goes up the back of her corset, which is a tight fitting garment. And because of that, it holds her in place because of the layers of clothing. And at this point, next week's adventure is getting the head done. And even when the head is done um, and things are ready for paint, I will have yet the next step after having the head and, and face done. It's gonna be creating a wig, which I have the hair for that. I'm hoping I have enough, fingers crossed. Um, and basically what I'm going to do is a traditional Elizabethan hairstyle. And I'm gonna look it up here, see if I can show you a picture. Um, probably very similar to my other doll. Where you basically will have that heart-shaped front, and then a bun in the back. Sort of that particular type of coiffure, you want to use a term. Because we are dealing with the 1570s. I just want to see if I can pull this up by itself. Let me see if I can pull it up on the site. This particular one doesn't seem to quite be it. The 1570s is trying to do a whole bunch of really tight little curls in the front. I'm trying to see about... Actually, since I didn't show you Elizabeth Littleton's 
image. I can hopefully show it to you here. Because I think she has, she has somewhat of a, I'm going to zoom in on her head really closely here. Okay. Mm. Focus. Focus with a, another illuminated object. But basically, we have a very rolled hairstyle right here, where it's rolled back and self-supported and creates kind of like a heart-like shape. And then there's a bun in the back right here. This is basically a, um, a call if you want to put it that way, that is going to self-contain the back and the rest of the hair. And this is highly decorated. So, you know, very elaborate looking. Uh, I don't know how. You can't see the shape of the face. A very elaborate looking outfit, things of that nature, which is coming along slowly but surely. I've been working on the sleeves. This would be for the kirtle, the underdress. And then I have basically everything else is cut, cut out as, as well. Here is the bodice. Now everything is pinned because these channels are going to have boning in them. This is the inside. That's the outside. Um, you won't have the shiny pins in there on the outside. I'm only going to be catching the inside lining as I'm sewing all of the channels for extra support. Let's see here. And then these are the two front pieces. Everything has been sewn, turn, turned right side out, pressed, and then the ends that are open that need stitching are, are there. And then eventually all the pieces will be sewn together and constructed into the garment. And this particular garment will have ribbons down the front for tying of, of the closure, which one side is pink and one side is red, which goes very well with the painting that I showed you here. Because on her sleeves, there's red and white varying different ribbons. And some of them are even tied together where one side of the ribbon is red and one side of the ribbon is like white or pink. And uh, looks like white, to be honest. But the nice thing about this is I'm using this painting as a inspiration so in that case, it's not going to be perfectly exact with the doll recreation. It'll look close. I especially want to recreate the hat. Definitely want to do that. It's pretty epic. Because you've got these big, wonderful feathers over here and this beautiful velvet hat with a strip of, of ribbon across the top. And um, I'm really hoping I can replicate it because I think it would be fun. The tricky bit is all the metal pieces. Um, there's several metal pieces across the front of this. And then there's even some along the edge of this piece in the back. So I just have to figure out, am I going to follow it exactly the way that it is? Or if I'm, if I'm going to use a different call, how that's going to look or use a, um, instead of using just the call, which is on the back of the head and this nice hairstyle in the front, do I want to use a, um, a coif, an embroidered black worked coif, which I do have one that's about, I think it's going to be the right size because even with this carved down and then you have hair on, on top, I think it's going to be just about the right size to put a coif right on top with the hair and, and everything. Because these fashion models, what I'm really creating here, these fashion models needed to be pretty accurate. They really needed to show the fashion of the time frame and show it in such a way that a tailor could understand what they're looking at 
and then try to replicate it for a person or a client, really. Let's try to put this down here. The back piece there. Trying to kind of keep everything organized. And then these are the separate sleeves. They're a little shorter, so you'll have the kirtle curled sleeves will show because these only go down about halfway, which is, um, I'm also using a, uh, I'm trying to think, I, it's not a woodcut. It would be more of a fashion plate from the 1570s. Now, granted, this is on Pinterest and I do have the, these images sourced back to their original uh, original pieces. Let me pull up my 1560s and 70s here. Well, it just doesn't come up very well, does it? Kind of hoping that a clearer picture would actually show up. It doesn't seem to. Oh, let me think here. In this image, I don't know if we can kind of calm it down. Nope, too light. This one's pretty good. There we go. Um, you basically have a hat with plumes, a very frilled ruff, and then a um, very poofy red 1570s gown, 1560s, 1570s. If you look at my, um, my doll, specifically my Arabella Stewart one on the top there. She's actually the right kind of doll. I don't know how it's going to show up here. But um, basically, ah, well, here we go. Kind of hard to see here. Yeah. But basically where you have the fitted bodice and the puffy sleeves and then the high necked ruff, that's pretty much what 1560s and 1570s was for English outfits. Oh, let's see. I don't know. This one's probably not going to show up that great. Oh, well, not too bad. Okay. So basically you have... A fitted sleeve on this one and then you have a an under kirtle a dress of a different color with striping and then you have the kind of hat this one has more of the velvet like hat like the other one did let's see if we can I think I'm overloading Pinterest here it, it can't doesn't know what to do with what everything I'm trying to do Let's try it again because we can. There we go. Oh, that's showing up. So, but a lot of basically fitted 1560s, 1570s gowns and then you have a kirtle underneath that's a different color which you know if you can wear one gown on, on top of another it's another way of doing conspicuous consumption of the not i'm not just wearing my nice dress i'm also wearing 
this uh, English fitted gown on top and don't I look fancy? I've got all these layers. That's, that's really what they tried to do. So it seems that quite a few of them had a coif and then would wear a hat over top. It's not unusual. Because even this other one with the blue seems to have a bit of a coif. Oh, there you go. There's like a bit of a coif underneath the taller hat. Besides all the other layers on top. So I'm basically going to keep it as close to the style as possible. And maybe just kind of pick some elements out from the era and a few different inspirations, like a slightly shorter sleeve and, and things like that. Um, Tudor Taylor shows a shorter sleeve for the fitted gown. And then you showed your other sleeve, excuse me, on the forearm. So they wore a lot more layers then than we do now. That's for sure. Let's see here. No particular questions. Just making sure because I don't want to be talking here and there not be a whole bunch of things or ha people have a whole bunch of things to say or questions. But um, she's coming along quite nicely. I mean, we really have the underwear is pretty much done. We The chemise is done. The stays are done and the eyelets um, hold the corset in just beautifully um I have I redid the bum roll that's I took some stuffing out of it it was almost overstuffed and that seems to really add to the shape so goals besides finishing the kirtle and finishing the outer dress is I still have to work on stockings yet so I have to do a set of stockings and I have some ribbon that I'll be able to use for a garter. I'd like to make those stockings green if I can help it. I do have some green wool, but it's really bulky because it's kind of an army blanket green and it's really thick. So I don't think that's gonna work for the stockings that I need, which will only go up to about the knee and then you tie a garter just below knee. So we'll see what happens. Um, and then I also have to make leather shoes, which I do have the patterns cut for those leather shoes. Um, I'm trying to give my hands a little bit of a rest. With all of the wood carving for the hands and the feet, the hands have been feeling a little sore, um, more so in the fingertips, because even with being slow and careful, you're putting a lot of pressure on your thumbs and your fingertips as you're going, as you're using these knives that I was showing earlier. So with all of that, I'd say we're probably about to the halfway point. There's still lots to do yet, but granted this was also a very large project. So being halfway through where we are at this point is, is saying something. Um, I'm not really going out anywhere or doing anything. So I've been just working on bits and pieces of this as I go. Besides um, working from home. And I mean, I, I feel very lucky that I can work from home. Not everybody has that availability with their kind of work that that's an option. I was saying to one of my friends, I could probably create a flow chart of who's mowing their lawn when. Um, there's some people who are almost religious about when they mow their lawn based on the last time that they mowed it. After I um, finish stitching these, I'm going to also iron this to, to smooth it out because even though I'm, I try to be careful and not distribute a lot of tension it sometimes happens especially when I want to make my stitches small so 
I'm hoping that everybody else is staying healthy, staying sane one way or the other, and are making the best of the not so wonderful situation that our world is currently in. I know some places are, are opening up, but you know, I highly still recommend if you can stay home, do. I mean, luckily we have, you know, we have the internet, we have uh, ways of shopping and having things delivered to our homes because, and that really makes us lucky as a nation, even though, yes, you have to wait for whatever items that you purchased are, but, you know, wait for them to come in to do whatever it is that you wanted to do. But at least we have that option. There's a lot of countries out there that don't even have the option of staying home and people are just getting sick and not always really surviving it. So, you know, for the sake of, of others, if you can stay home, do. Let me see. I have a magnet in there that keeps the uh, pins from flying all over the place. So I'm hoping to post a bit more when I get things painted. So that's more or less carve the head, get that done, paint as far as do a gesso layer on the head, the hands and the feet, and then also do the forearms and the shins of the doll. Let those dry. So she'll have to be stripped down. She, she won't obviously be able to stay dressed and not make a mess out of the, the clothes. But I have her dressed right now so I could do fitting purposes, both for the arms eye on the bodices, because I had to fit those to the doll. And also fitting in the sleeves and things like that takes a bit of, of time. But I'm hoping to post a little bit more on that when I get there. And I'm I have updated my blog with two posts, one specifically about the clothes, the other one about the woodworking so far. And then I'm going to be doing another one on the woodworking about doing the heads, hands and feet. So that is an upcoming blog because I do have pictures to show a, a lot better pictures because obviously I can't put the pictures on my phone and try to show you guys because, well, it's glowing and the light surrounding light doesn't seem to allow me to show you guys those kind of pictures better if I, I print them out it looks like at this point but hey it's a beautiful day outside so I might take advantage of of the evening and uh try to get more of the, the head done. And I'm going to have to figure out where my whetstone is. I have one, yes, but I got to figure out where I stored it. Because I got to keep these knives sharp so that they're, um, so it doesn't take a lot of work to cut through through the wood, not a lot of hand pressure. Because I, as I've carved the hands and the feet, I've noticed that wood carving itself can be quite the workout be honest. And with that, I mean, hey, who doesn't need a little bit of exercise? But uh, one also doesn't want to have to do a whole bunch of effort on your hands with, with carving knives. And then when they should have been a bit sharper and you're causing more pressure on your hands than, than what you need. So have 
having and maintaining your tools is very important. Even a, a needle and thread, is, um, keeping your needle sharp is very helpful and getting the most out of that, the needle that you have is very, very important. Of course, it also depends on what you're sewing. If you're sewing through boning channels or reed, your needle is going to dull a lot quicker than if you're just sewing through silk or other things. And yet again, if there's any burrs in your needle, the silk will tell you because it won't just glide right through. I'm almost done with this seam. Time flies when you're having fun and you have good company. Checking for cats because, well, most of the time they like to sneak in the room when I'm not paying attention and a lot of them just like to go lay on the bed. We are catless currently. But if you do have any questions about the current dastardly doll project and any questions in regards to wood carving, the tools that I used, the methods that I used, the um, any questions about the clothing that I am making for the doll, or other kinds of questions like wig making will be a thing coming up here very shortly. So if anything comes to mind, or um, you can certainly just leave the questions in the comments. Also, I do have uh, like a contact email that you can, can send questions to fairydustcollector at gmail.com. Fairy being F-A-E-R-Y, then D-U-S-T-C-O-L-L-E-C-T-O-R at gmail. Let's see. Keep my snip snip by here. Well, I certainly hope that you have a wonderful weekend and stay safe, stay healthy, keep busy, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.